Welcome to another episode of Teen Minds Redefined, where we redefine our relationships with our teenagers in school, at home, and anywhere else that they need some support. And today, I welcome to our show, uh, Katie Selby. And I'm really excited because Katie's profile fits mm -hmm kids that I've worked with in high school for years and years. So I was really excited about uh, talking to Katie and sharing her story. Katie's journey is not just a story of personal triumph, it's a beacon of hope and empowerment for many. Diagnosed with a language impairment at three and learning disabilities at five, Katie has navigated a path that many might find daunting. But she stands here today, a testament to resilience and the power of self-advocacy. Growing up as the only person with a disability in her immediate and extended family, Katie faced unique challenges. Her journey through the special education system from the tender age until high school graduation laid the foundation for her remarkable advocacy skills. It wasn't until her junior year of high school under the guidance of a special education teacher who encouraged her to step out of her shell that Katie truly found her voice defying the expectations set by others, including her high school guidance counselor, Katie pursued her dream of higher education. She not only attended college, but also learned to effectively advocate for her educational needs. With a college degree in hand, she now dedicates her life to supporting individuals with disabilities, both in school and at home, helping them realize their potential and independence. Katie's social circle is as unique as her journey. Surrounded by friends who share similar life experiences, she finds strength and understanding, not in the form of a support group, but in the solidarity of shared experiences. Her voice has reached many through a blog article called The Mighty, contribution, contributions to various learning disability, social media pages, podcasts, and presentations. She is currently channeling her experiences into a book about her life, further extending her reach and impact. Kate's mission is to empower and engage individuals to become advocates for themselves and to take charge of their educational life journeys. And today she's here to share her inspiring story with us. So please join me in welcoming Katie Selby. Hi, Katie. Hi, thank you for having me today. I am very excited about this. I have had um, one other so far, uh, gentleman who was diagnosed with ADHD at a very late stage in life, and you are the opposite. Katie, can you, do you want to add to that? Is there anything I'm missing? What do you want our audience to hear? Well, I would like to start at the beginning and just share my my life story. As you had said, I am a person with a language impairment and learning disabilities. And at the young age of three years old, I was diagnosed with a language impairment. And at the beginning, as I was growing growing up and and all that, my parents noticed that I had developmental delays. I had delays in walking and of course communicating. And, and when I was three years old, I was completely nonverbal, did not say a full sentence until I was five years of age. So at the young age of three years old, my parents looked into speech therapy for me, and they looked into asking our doctor if he knew of anyone or if he could um, give me the speech therapy. And at the time, the health insurance company um, would only said that the doctor, the doctor prescri prescribed it, that they would cover it. Well, then my parents looked into asking family and they had said that there's a school for people with speech and language diagnoses. Um, and I went to school um, at three years of age, I, with no verbal communication. So my parents and teachers purposely ignored my gestures and my body language to try to get me to communicate. Well, um, at that time, um, I was, um, working or 
my mom was working at a garden shop, which is named after me. And, um, and I would just show my frustration and body language and, um, almost like fall and hit, lunge and hit myself to the ground and hit my head. And, um, when I was excited, I would jump up and down and just have a smile on my face to get my communication out that way with showing body language. And I would also do that in the community and, and, um, other places. And while I was in preschool, <clears throat> I kind of kept to myself. I didn't really have friends. My only friends were my brother, Alan and my cabbage patch doll, cabbage patch doll, Faye Ronnie, which I still have oh. today. And then I got into kindergarten. And as you were saying, I was diagnosed with learning disabilities at the young age of five years old. I was in a self-contained class from kindergarten through first grade, which means that I had just um, a few kids in my class and I would get more one-on-one -on -one atten attention. And I would get pulled out for speech and language, occupational therapy. And then in the middle of first grade, they went ahead and saw my potential and <clears throat> kind of integrated me into my grade level classes. So I would go to math class in first grade for the second half of that semester. And then I was fully integrated into my, the general education classes with peers. And I was still pulled out for speech and language resource and occupational therapy until I was in third grade. Then the occupational therapy services was dropped. And like I had said, I did not say my first whole sentence until I was five years old. And to this day, I wish I knew what those words were and my parents don't even know. And um, I met my first friend in kindergarten and we're still friends today. Wow, that is. So let's back up just for our listeners. Can you explain to me? For our listeners, what is a language impairment? A language impairment is where you have difficulty finding the right words to communicate to others. And what was the what was the correlation between the learning disability and the language impairment? Like, what is your learning disability? Is it in communication? My learning disabilities are in reading comprehension, written expression, and math. Okay. And so the language impairment is you have the thought, you have what it is you want to say, mm -hmm. you just, the processing speed and the time to get it out and the words to use were the difficulty. Is that correct? Am I saying yeah. that right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's talk about, you, you were in a self-contained class and I know you were young and I'm not sure how much of a memory you would have of that, but what is your feeling about self-contained classes now? Well, I do work now in a self-contained classroom, um, an essential, well, now we call it an essential, an essential, essential skills classroom um, at the elementary school that I'm at. And mm -hmm. um, back then when I was growing up, I didn't have, they didn't have a position too much as paraprofessionals to help support students with disabilities in the self-contained classrooms. Mm -hmm. So today I think it's great that there's that extra support where the paraprofessionals can help support the students in their general education setting. And so now many of our listeners have neurodivergent teenagers, can you tell me, first of all, so I say neurodiverse, yeah. some say atypical, some say disability, some say differently abled. What do you prefer and does it matter? Um, it, I don't have a different phrase that I typically use. <laughs> so, no, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's so, you know, I just never want to 
make anybody feel like I'm not hearing what they're saying. So let's go to self-advocacy because I think whether we have kids with diagnoses or not, self-advocacy is vital, absolutely vital. So tell me, tell me in your words, first of all, what does it mean to be able to self-advocate? It means to speak up for yourself and get the support that you need as a person. And um, I also felt that in elementary and middle school, I didn't receive those um, <clears throat> those strategies, probably because I was kind of shy and quiet and, and all that. And they were more focused on the students that had more difficulty. So, um, and then I finally just branched out and spoke up for myself when I got that nudge from, from the special education teacher. So what strategies did you use? Like what made you able to speak up for yourself and ask for help? My, well, in my junior year of, um, high school, I was in a class within a class, which means I had a special education teacher in the class with a general education teacher helping support everyone in the class. And mm -hmm. I would always go to her because I felt comfortable. I built really great rapport with her to ask questions. And one day she just told me, why don't you, instead of always coming to me, why don't you go to your general education teacher ask for clarification and if you still don't understand you could always come back to me and that just that just sunk into me and ever since i just advocated for for myself i love that i love that because i think you know there's that line where parents feel like they have to be the voice they have to be the one they have to be and and then the kids get to high school or they get beyond high school and they haven't got a clue. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I, can you speak to parents about the, a strategy for them so that yes, they have a voice in their kids' education, but they have to take a back seat to allowing them to ask for help and I also found, and you can speak to this as well, as I found a lot of kids when I was working in the high school felt like they were putting a teacher out to ask for their accommodations. Oh, I don't want to bug them. Oh, I'm going to feel silly. Oh, so can you speak to that from first experience? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I would give the advice to parents by letting their child or students just maybe belong and in, come into the IEP. I was able to come to the IEP when I was a freshman in high school through 12th grade. But I also believe that maybe that maybe the students should come when they're younger as well, even just a little bit, just so they that they know that, you know what, I can speak on what I would like to see how to be successful and what goals to set and maybe just talking with the parents and students they can talk together to see where they feel they're at yeah i couldn't agree more and for me working in high school part of my job in special education was going to the grade eight iep uh, iep review meetings to move into grade nine. Mm -hmm. And I refused to sit down unless the kid was at the table because for exactly that reason. Yes. <laughs> because it feels like it normalizes it, I think, for the kids. It normalizes to say, hey, this is this isn't a favor. This is what you're entitled to. Mm -hmm. This is a legal document. And this is something that's going to grow with you forever. You know, and you may not need, you know, the accommodations um you know there's probably a huge slew of accommodations you would use in high school that you typically might not need in college as much only because mm -hmm. you've chosen things that suit you so you're a little more motivated not even motivated you're a little more um able to access what you're interested in if that makes any sense 
but I know you went to college. So let's talk about supports in post-secondary that people think are, oh, there's no way. Once they get out of high school, there's no help. There's no nothing. Can you speak to that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when I was um, looking at going to college, I started at the local community college and I worked with the their access office, their disability related services office. And it took me some time to find the right um, counselor who under, understood me. And, and I am so glad that I found her. Um, we're still friends today. And yeah. she really um, noticed my drive in school and just helped me out a lot. And then when, and then as I was transferring to Merrimack to Maryville, I did use Maryville's disability services office for a year until I figured my teachers are a little bit more support have, I can get more support from my teachers and feedback on what I feel I, I need to get through my classes. And what did you find the most helpful? So what accommodations did you find like hands down? This was perfect for me. This was really helpful. The, um, the out of class testing and extended time and having a reader just read the test to me. That's really important. And those, you know, and this is, and I'm talking for college now, is that what you're Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I, I like what you said about it took you some time to find the right counselor. So hear this. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be the perfect person right off. Right. And you have to advocate to find somebody else because there are people there who are there to help you, but you need to have that. I know you need a vibe, right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. You just need mm -hmm. to have yeah. that. Uh, yeah, and I think that's so important. So if you don't find it, it's like therapy. It's like a doctor. It's like a dentist. If you don't find the first one, you keep looking. There are there's more people out there who want to help mm -hmm. for sure. So, can we just talk a little bit then about thinking about your high school years? What do you wish you knew, and what do you wish other people knew? to make your high school experience even better? I wish I knew like when I was growing up that I could always ask for help. I could always mm -hmm. speak up and say, I don't understand this. Um, and that I could build rapport with teachers and <clears throat> find the right teacher to help me nudge me in the right direction. <laughs> And what do you wish teachers would know? Is there something you could say to, like some teachers, everybody does the best they can, but I know that sometimes it's not as easy in different classes. So if you could speak to the teachers who didn't make it quite so easy or quite so accessible, what would you say? Well, especially for math is try and get on the student's level and try and see if you can come up with a way that they can under, understand. It took me years and years to get through math, even in college. Um, after I got through math, my friends and I had a party where I just um, put my papers into a bonfire and said goodbye. <laughs> I love that. I hate math. I mean, mm -hmm. I get sweaty when I, you know, even when I was working in the, in the special education office and kids would come in with their homework, they knew if it's math, don't be asking mm -hmm. me anything because I'll set yeah. you back. I won't move you forward. <laughs> so I hear you. And that's, that's really good advice because I think sometimes teachers just continue to repeat the same lesson to say it over and over and over. And that's mm -hmm. not how I'm hearing it. So can you, you know, change, change the way you're actually teaching it is probably really helpful. Um, so is there anything we can talk about in the sense of like the social dynamics in high school? How did, I know you had a friend and you continued to have a friend right through. 
Um, was there any difficulty in your social environment in high school? Yes, I um I like well going through school starting at the beginning at, in elementary school, it was difficult to find friends that were like atypical or like in the general education setting. I always stuck with what I knew and um, made friends that were like me because we understood each other. Mm -hmm. And then did that continue through high school or did things get a little more comfortable? That continued through high, through, through high school and through college as well. So is there something we can say to kids in high school? Is there a message we could give about inclusion, about acceptance? Maybe like be a buddy to someone with a disability, like <clears throat> see what their interests are and maybe you have the same interest and see if and there's any way you could support them and help have them feel comfortable in in school. Okay, so let's talk then about self-advocating as a peer. So we're not asking for help from teachers. We're not asking help from parents. Can you advise kids about using those skills with peers? Sure. And I would also like say if you don't understand a math question or understand what the teacher said, you could always maybe go to a peer in class and say, hey, did you get that? Did you understand understand that? And then maybe maybe bridging that gap to where they can they feel that that they can talk with um, a a peer in the general education setting. That's really good advice. Now you are you've done a blog. Talk about this blog. Well, I wrote. As I was um, sharing, started was with my aunt. She nominated me for a mental health champions award through the state of Missouri. Um, I was nice. I was so glad to just to be nominated. So then that kind of kind of spiraled into me, like you know what, I can share my story with the world. So I just found the mighty and shared. Um, wrote up an article and my aunt helped me edit it and once it was out there a lot of people i got a lot of reactions from people saying oh your start story is so awesome and amazing so then i just went ahead and looked up other facebook communities on pages and said hey would you like to share my story so that just kind of spiraled and then i um decided in 2020 um, in the pan pandemic, mm -hmm. um, pre-pandemic, I read a, a book called Stutter Interrupted by Nina G. She is a person with dyslexia and a person who st stutters, and she is a comedian. So I read her book, and I'm like thinking to myself, this her story is kind of a little similar to mine, mm -hmm. and that I could write, maybe I should start writing try and write a book about my life. So that's where I'm at now. And I'm also sharing my story with other podcasts and um, in different present presentations. I love that because I think, you know, one thing I think we forget and don't have to have a diagnosis for that about asking for help is that we want to help. Mm -hmm. like, like, I want to help people. You want to help people. You're writing a book. You're sharing your story. Like, people want to help. So it's, I always try to think of it, it's, it's a gift if I get to help you. So it's a gift if I invite you to help me. Like, people want to help. And so by using your self-advocacy skills, you are giving someone else a gift, not just yourself. People have big hearts and they want to help and they want to share and they want to support. And that's why we have communities like this. And I think it's so important, like turn it around 
in the sense that it's not you asking for help, you're giving someone else the opportunity to help you. And when you talked about the special education teacher, I think that really turned things around for you. Yes. Can you imagine how she feels right now? <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. It, it, I, I love that. I love stories that people talk about teachers that helped or friends that, that you know, connected or, or did something. Like, it's just these stories of helping, helping, helping that people love to help. So using your self-advocacy skills are not just for you by any means they're giving someone else a gift to help you yes yeah that's that's awesome. so do we have a name for your book yet not yet <laughs> not okay yet. <laughs> well you have to let us know so i am going to i know i have your contacts here but uh if you could send me a link to your article that would be great as well so okay. you can read that and then when the book comes out we can meet again and talk about the book. Okay. <laughs> that would be great. Anything, any other advice, anything else we didn't get to that you want to share? Well, um, I like to share that I also speak at the school at on their abilities day. I've done that for the past two years, spoken with the students um, in the upper grade levels, the third through fifth, and they really seem to enjoy my story and and hearing what I have to say. And I just also feel that when I work with students with autism that are nonverbal and have mm -hmm. communication devices, I feel that um, I can understand them because I was nonverbal yeah. when I was three to five. And I'd also like to say, I do have a special needs dog that I um, actually, um, that actually, um, <laughs> <clears throat> advocate for his needs and his brother's needs oh. and um he, barney um is an 11 year old dachshund who has scoliosis so i make sure that he gets um to, to his laser therapy appointments and chiropractic care as needed and his brother fred is just there for support for him <laughs> so that's amazing. What a beautiful yeah. heart you have. Yes. Ah, that's so sweet. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. I really appreciate your story and I know other people will. And especially, you know, somebody sitting there going, ah, am I, am I there? Should I be asking? Yes. Ask, yes. ask for help. And it only gets easier. People want to help. And um, thank you for sharing this. It's really important information and I appreciate you joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you. And thank you for listening to another episode of Teen Minds Redefined. Thank you, Katie Selvey, for sharing your story. And uh, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.